Alright, in the midst of it, if say you have any uh, questions, feel free to use the chat. Uh, but uh, I beg your understanding that uh, because uh, it's technical, right? So it, it flies all the way up and I didn't manage to catch it or the moderator later didn't manage to catch it. Uh, do let us know by typing in again. Right? Okay, great to see so many of you. very clean. I don't know to <laughs> Alright, maybe we will just uh, begin for those uh, who are on time and who are early. I see people in here waiting since 6.40 already. Right, so uh, yeah, welcome everyone. So uh, I'm William. I'm from the entrepreneurship team in SUSS. So some of you have seen me around, some of you have heard my name, some of you have seen my email. Yes, we are a very lean team, so most of the things you will see me. Lah, right? Uh, yes, and we are very honoured and privileged today to have uh, three different panellists, all in um, specialised in their own domains, uh, starting up, at a, have, have experiences in, in, in the field as well. Alright, to share with us, let me stop the Right, so uh, yes, I, I, I'm, I think I'm in between you and also the speakers. So I will, I will just begin directly. So uh, maybe I'll give a brief introduction of the entrepreneurship team in SUSS first. So we are a very lean team uh, with uh, our head of program and also a few of our colleagues. We are doing programs to support entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs want to be like maybe some of you here who want to, to, to do something, right? Alright, so we are here to support you with our different programs which I'll share later. So this is one of the diff uh, programs that we have for you to expose yourself into uh, entrepreneurship and also hear from the founders. Maybe they'll spark you with something, right, uh, that you really want to do. Okay, so uh, most of you are here because you are here to satisfy your pre-WA entrepreneurial mindset requirement. Uh, it's understandable. Uh, if you are here for that, um, please make sure that you stay throughout because there will be a QR code at the end of the session that you must fill in with some questions for, and you must submit that in order for you to fulfill that uh, criteria, right? If not, you will not be able to do your uh, work attachment. Okay, uh, so the same thing in the midst of it, if there's any questions, feel free to use the chat. Alright, so uh, going straight in... All right. Yeah, so what you see is actually the different kind of programs that uh, we provide for our students, all the way from pre-idea to traction. All right. So uh, what you see here, or what you are attending now is actually a pre-idea stage uh, startup, uh, not startup, a pre-idea stage program. Right. So our team, we are very, very different in a way that all of us has experience in the field. So myself, I was an entrepreneur. Our head of program, she was an entrepreneur. We have people who are with the uh, governing uh, agencies, managing grants and, and stuff. So uh, we know the scene very well. We know uh, what you guys need, what you guys want as well. All right. <clears throat> so this from Idea to Startup Workshop, this is one of the program where you can uh, use to generate your ideas or, or rather uh, get, get in, in involved, immersed into the, the startup scene by, by, by creating the entrepreneur mindset. Right, the next program we have is actually the Impact Startup Challenge. Or rather, if you are doing your ECR, if you are looking at the course code, is CDO303. Right, so this is one of our key programs. I'll share a bit more later. We are opening recruitment as well for the next run, which will be happening in January. Okay, so you will see different competitions, hackathons, mentorship. We have our own entrepreneur in residence. We have country managers. So if you want to start overseas, we have that access into the overseas market as well. Right, we have overseas uh, officers. We have officers in Vietnam, Indonesia, China. So we, our, our support is there for you to start overseas. Right, the next key program that we have is actually the Alibaba Cloud SUSS Entrepreneurship Program. So if you um, have heard of it, uh, this is actually a program that, actually, that awards you a minor 
or a certificate once you pass the program. So what I always like to say, this is all. This is the easiest uh, program, or rather the easiest minor if you are taking it as a minor. All right, but there is some risk to it in a way. Uh, you must pass the program in order to get a minor. So if by the end of the 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 wait when you graduate, you don't pass the minor, then you you do don't get the minor lah. All right, and passing criteria, what you have to do is just uh, working on your startup, getting it validated. It's really OTOT. You'll be linked up with our entrepreneur in residence, a very, very experienced person in the field. Uh, started up numerous times, validated numerous ideas. Uh, work with him, uh, raise your funding. So uh, you can either um, get any government grant or the, like the SG Startup Founder Grant, which have been uh, shared or rather announced by Enterprise Singapore, I think just last week, is up to $50,000, right? And SUSS will be awarding you another $10,000 to match up that $50,000. Okay, that's one way. Or you can raise any amount from uh, angels or VCs. And if raising funds is not your thing, you can actually consider doing this as... Uh, a revenue uh, way. So what you have to do is you just have to earn a 250,000 uh, annual revenue in order to uh, pass the program. So you have two and a half years to do that. Right? So some of, some of the students, they, 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 they want to do a work attachment and entrepreneurial work attachment. That is also fine. So you just have to let us know. We will link you up with a mentor and the mentor will explain more in depth to you. Uh, to you for, for that, right? Okay. Uh, all right. And the next slide I have is the Impact Startup Challenge. So the next run is actually our inaugural run that uh, we have. So it's us. It's called ACI ASEAN China Impact Startup Challenge, right? So what happens here is for the first time people and participants from 10 different cities will be coming together. So you can see yourself working with people from China, from Cambodia, from Vietnam, from Indonesia, from Philippines, and, and many more. All right. So what you do here is in that six days of bootcamp, you will be validating your idea. So you work uh, with your team, you speak to uh, potential customers. So we call that session, get out of the building session. You meet, network with people, and then uh, pitch your idea uh, to uh, investors. So you get an experience of how it is like to be an entrepreneur itself. So definitely, it's, the journey is not easy, but we are here to assist as well. So giving you this kind of platform. Okay, so for those who are interested, uh, this is actually a five credit bearing uh, course. So you can actually uh, remember this CDO 303 ACI and apply it for it during uh, ECR itself. All right. Um, if you don't want to take it as a credit bearing course, you just want to experience how it is like, attend the course, pick up skills, because we focus a lot on the Lean Startup methodology. So that is very useful, especially for entrepreneurs. If you you have started something yourself, you'll know how useful it, this Lean Startup model is, right? So uh, we focus a lot on that. If you want to experience that, you don't have enough credits to use, uh, you, 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 you just want to be part of it, learn something, you can also apply for it as a non-credit bearing participant. All right, so you can find out more about the, the whole program in the link below. Right, so I'll just leave there for a couple more seconds if you want. It's bit.ly slash ACI dash info. All right. Okay, yes, uh, I'm hiding that first. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, enough of me sharing. I think uh, that that's a glimpse of what the entrepreneurship programs are. If you wish to have a support we have other programs as well running parallel to this, right? What I'm sharing is more of our key programs. So if you are in the gig economy, you are a freelancer, we also have a program for that. We are working with Facebook, with Google, with NAS Academy, Creatives at Work. All of them are industry specialized. Uh, yeah, they, they are specialized in their own industry, right? So you can look out for those in your email, right? So without further ado, I will... Uh, introduce to you our first speaker. So um, he will be sharing about his uh, startup journey 
followed by um, the other two speakers and they will be coming together for a panel discussion. Right, so if you have any questions for them, feel free to pop it in, in the chat function below. Okay, so the first speaker we have is uh, Adam. So Adam is uh, very young, I think um, younger than some of you or, or same age as some of you here. Right, so it's a very rare experience to hear from a young uh, founder like him. So he's the founder of Cloud Intern. Uh, Cloud Intern, same as the other startups, right, are actually part of the Alibaba Cloud program. So you can find out from him what it is like to be a uh, part of the program. Okay, all right, Adam, over to you. All right, hi guys, um, my name is Adam. Um, I've been actually running a web development firm for the last two years, it's called Startup Booth. We did a couple of projects for SUSS, um, PMI, ACCA, and um, so like Singapore Sports School. And recently I became the founder of Cloud Intern. So uh, to provide some context, uh, I am a NTU student, computer science, as well as the SUSS CET student taking part in the Alibaba Cloud program. So before I actually talk about Cloud Intern, let me share in like a, a brief history about my e-commerce journey, uh, my entrepreneurship journey. So I started in 2015 um, doing e-commerce, right? I spent my diploma days on the Q10 sales manager and spending like thousands of dollars every month on like Facebook ads. In 2018, I decided to challenge myself to start a startup. I was very inspired by, you know, like Grab and these massive startup services. And I took the dive, spent a lot of my money uh, and launched a startup. My team was part of an incubation pipeline and I worked on it diligently for like nine months. Uh, we failed terribly. Um, so I had two developers on contract back then and we decided to do ad hoc web development to recoup our losses, right? Around $30,000 in losses. Uh, I eventually found doing web development like profitable and thus my web development firm was born. So when COVID hit, a lot of businesses were forced online, right? So business had to go digital to survive. Like ancient decade old businesses were looking to build websites for the very first time because their showrooms were closed and like retail stores wanted to build e-commerce stores to continue selling their product. One common trait was that a lot of these businesses were trying to save money, right? It's obvious revenue was down. Um, businesses had to cut expenses to maintain liquidity. A very strange trend happened during the circuit breaker. My web development firm was getting a lot of projects and requests to help businesses automate processes. So these processes can be from revitalizing their customer relationship management system or to redesign how they acquire clients online. These businesses wanted to automate the tedious, repetitive, and like man hour consuming tasks to save costs. It was during that month, the, the circuit breaker month, that I had the idea for Cloud Intern. Um, I'm actually going to bring up my um, deck here, my pitch deck. Um, fun fact, it was the same deck that I used uh, when I got into the Alibaba Cloud program. So I'll try my best not to bore you guys. Um, so what cloud interns are, they are basically modular chatbots with the purpose of automating customers' interaction and processes. So uh, I could go through on and on about chatbots and stuff, but I'm sure that most of you already use chatbots before. Um, what makes cloud intern a little bit more special is that we actually pre-train AI models. So each AI models, which we term um, AI modules, right, have a specialization in a particular field and are personalized as interns, right? Hence, cloud interns. For example, Valerie, the customer support module, is trained to answer very customer-oriented, complex questions such as, um, can you help me process my refund? Or how long more till my parcel arrive? How much does your service cost? Typically, a normal chatbot will not be able to understand such complex instructions well. However, armed with a pre-trained model, the chatbot can better understand intent context and execute more complex instructions. Over time, as more and more business you hopefully use this cloud intern, um, the bots will get faster, smarter with all the data from the businesses that run them. I can go through a little bit, just a quick rundown on how it works, right? We are a managed service startup. We first build and install a customized cloud intern chatbot onto the business website and messaging platforms like Facebook Messenger. Whenever a, vis a visitor or prospective client interact uh, with the business via these channels, the cloud intern will automatically reply to all the interactions, send all the conversations to a centralized inbox, 
and then follow up automation processes based on the context of the conversation. So this automation procedure can be as simple as adding the customer information to the business CRM system, or even maybe more complex processes such as tagging the visitors to a specific email campaign. Very technical, yes, I know, I'm sorry. At the end of the day, the business can save labor resources as customer interactions are mostly automated, right? The businesses spend less time keeping track of their messages as they are provided with a centralized inbox and they reduce the time for follow-up actions as their cloud intern can automate processes in their existing business stack. So it's very businessy and um, it's a very niche product. Cloud intern was not started to be like the next real, like the disruptive startup or like the next billion dollar idea, but instead it's to provide SME businesses a simple solution to a rather annoying problem that I found a lot of my clients were facing. It's not a perfect product yet, and I'm still looking to refine it with my early adopters. Uh, in the last month, we got five purchase order um, just with our MVP, and SUSS is actually one of them. So, uh, I mean, I can share it. It's, uh, our pricing model is that it's a subscription-based model. Every year, it's around $1,000 for businesses. So, so far, we have $5,000. Yay. Um, SUSS is in the midst of helping us secure a little bit more funding for Cloud Intern hopefully for around an additional $30,000 by the end of the month. So usually uh, with my friends, especially if they're first time entrepreneurs, this is like some of the advice that I'll usually tell them. If you're a first time entrepreneur, it might be a good idea to scale down your big idea. You know, some of you guys might have like massive, huge ideas. Start small and lean. Focus on being sustainable and then build up slowly. Even if you do not succeed the first time, right? you still use less resources and you can still always pivot with a lightweight idea. Also, if like your capital is very limited, right? you don't have a lot of savings or you can't afford to spend so much money on your startup idea, do not be afraid to learn new skills to do the work yourself to lower down costs. You know, skills like digital marketing, you know, content creation, and even coding can be learned online for free from YouTube and like, you know, sites like Udemy and Skillshare. Also, there are a lot of no-code development platforms out there nowadays, meaning platform that allows you to build like your idea, your startup idea without you needing to even code at all. Um, if you guys actually want some examples, you guys can hit me up on LinkedIn and I will provide you some resources on like if you want to explore actually building your startup solution without code. One thing that I always remind my friends is that success is never linear, right? It doesn't really matter how early you start your journey. You can be 22, like I am, or you can be 30. You can be a zero today and be a hundred in a couple of months. Success is like not linear, super exponential. Just because someone start early doesn't mean that they will be successful, right? So I think the most important thing is that everyone, if you have an idea and there's something that you're really passionate about, you should start today. Um, yeah, so that is all from me. Um, I will be looking forward to answer any questions you guys might have during the panel session. Thanks, guys. Great, thanks, Adam. So uh, the next speaker that you'll be hearing from and uh, who is also part of the panel later will be Venice. So Venice is from uh, Levan, also part of the Alibaba Cloud uh, Startup. So I'll leave it to her to introduce to you guys. Hi guys, uh, I'm Bernice from Levent. Uh, thanks for your introduction, William. Can I just have a very quick show of hands? Um, who is single here? Could you just like, you know, switch on your video or maybe wave? Or you know, bottom right, you can click on the reaction button. Yeah, just let me just do a count. Uh, a moderator is single as well. Oh, okay. hi. Or maybe we can, we can do something uh, you can just type one in the chat so that we can see, right? Oh, awesome. I mean, sorry, I'm so happy that so many people are single, but okay. A lot of people typing one. And anyway, um, and all of you guys, who, who's using dating apps? Or who, you know of anyone using dating apps? If either, just raise your hands again. Uh, okay, it's a lot of people. Anyway, awesome. So now that I got you guys' attention, and since pretty much 
close to half of half of the um, audience uh, is single using dating app or know someone dating app. Um, so you should pay attention for the next 10 minutes because at Levan we are building a dating app to help you save time, not waste time anymore, or your single friend's time. Okay, if you guys have paid attention in math classes back in secondary school, you will have learned that in Venn diagram terminology, two overlapping circles is a union. So at Levan, we are helping singles to find who fit their criteria and whose criteria they fit. Um, we are supported by government agency, uh, Enterprise Singapore, as well as the Alibaba Cloud SUSS program that William mentioned. Our team all came from startup background. Uh, prior to working with working at PolicyPal, uh, I spent a couple of years at an investment bank in Hong Kong. And our product manager and engineers have a combined 17 years of experience working in the startup tech scene. We are advised by Val, who recently got listed in Fortune 40 under 40. So uh, cuts that long story short, uh, what problem are we solving here? We are solving fatigue towards existing dating apps. And what do I mean by that? Um, or rather, why, why is that so? There are two main reasons why users feel jaded of the existing dating apps. Firstly, dating apps are extremely time consuming and tiring, which I'm sure most of you guys understand. For an average user, having been on dating apps for, let's say, in the last several years, it's very normal for you to go through this long and tiring process. You know, step one, uh, you go to two or 300,000 profiles in Singapore. Uh, that is the number, yes. Step two, thousands of matches. Step three, um, the chats. Step four, the first dates. And step five, finding out the certain deal breakers after some time only to have to go through the whole painful cycle once again. A second reason why existing dating, dating apps don't work is option paralysis. Imagine you go to lunch and instead of seeing just 10 burgers on the menu, you will now see 100,000 burgers on the menu. It will take a long time to choose which one to have and as much uh, research study, studies have shown, you will not be happy with your choice and will probably regret your decision later. For dating apps, users go through 100,000 profiles and it's just really ineffective. We see the pain points of users and know that the solution is to build a platform that acts as a dating agency almost while operating at a freemium model so that there's enough network effect. We surveyed hundreds of singles in Singapore to collate the 20 criteria that most singles care about. When users take just uh, five minutes to fill out this list of criteria, there is the ability for the user to change the app into any niche dating app you wish. You can change the band into a Christian dating app, a Muslim dating app, or even a workaholics dating app. Because this is a customizable niche app for the mass market, that is the network effect for a lot of users to join, while at the same time helps users save time because uh, it can really act as the exact filter that uh, you need. We carry out in-depth research into the dating industry, and I'm sure you guys have come across this uh, competitive matrix in your business courses. Uh, we found it very interesting that there are two ends to the industry spectrum really. So at the one end, uh, the bottom right, you can see the usual dating apps like Tinder, CMV that I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with. But for this mass market uh, dating apps, uh, the incumbent dating apps, they, they, have, they have the issue of um, quantity and option paralysis. And at the other end, the top left corner, uh, there are live dating agencies that charge um, members thousands of dollars. Not sure you guys uh, saw a trending article for the last two weeks. Uh, a lady paid $3,000 just to get three dates. That's $1,000 to meet one person. Um, it's a lot of money. And if you were to Google, how many dating apps are there in the world today? There are 1,500. But probably more than 99% of them are niche dating apps that don't work. And what do I mean by niche dating apps? It's, uh, it can be any niche you can think of. Like there's um, Beard Lover dating app, 
that's dog lover dating app, that, that's Christian dating app, of course. But these niche dating apps, they have the same problem as dating agencies. Because for a social platform to work, there needs to be network effect like Instagram and TikTok. When it's too targeted or too expensive, like the dating agencies, there isn't enough chatter about it and the user base doesn't grow big enough for it to work. We see a massive gap between these two ends of the industry spectrum and Levant is the one and only mass market dating app that um, provides you with the number effect but also saves you time at the same time. So Levant is built by users for users really. Every single element of Levant is built as per user needs and to benefit them. But instead of tooting our own horn, uh, let's see what our users have to say. We invited our pre-launch users to try our app and they absolutely loved it. Uh, for those of you who are perhaps Netflix fans, maybe you have watched Indian Matchmaking. Uh, one user, Gwen, she likened us to Sima the Matchmaker. And Weyang over here describes our recommendations features like a human version of Amazon reviews. Essentially, Levent is an honest quality dating app that helps singles to not waste time. So the beauty of Levant is that we are able to bring that step five of finding out deal breakers to step zero before you even match with the other person. We scan the entire user base to show you the top five or 10 profiles daily curated as per your needs and the other person's needs. And these users fit what you are looking for and you fit what they are looking for as well. Um, as a result, you're able to spend a shorter amount of time on building deeper and more meaningful connections with quality matches. With recommendations, you can also learn more about the other user from their friends' perspectives. And enough of cheesy pickup lines or stopping at, hey, hi, how are you? It's so much easier to start chatting your match on a meaningful level because you, your chat uh, begins with what you both like about each other's profile the most. So you guys can talk about what, uh, you know, what interests you the most uh, right away instead of all this superficial talk like how's your day, how's your week. So as mentioned earlier, uh, we are launching our beta app uh, next month and yeah, you guys should register yourself as a user today if you're single or you can tell your single friends too because early signups will get app credits to use additional features in our free app and I'm happy to chat with you guys more in details in terms of um, you know, starting our startup journey in this um, pandemic times later on uh, during the Q&A session. Yeah, so that's all for now. Thanks everyone. All right, thanks Bernice. Okay, uh, our next speaker, same thing, uh, also from uh, our Alibaba Club program. All right, uh, she is, uh, let me see where's her name. All right, uh, she's Amanda, all right? So uh, she's from uh, Combined Cell. So I'm sure if you are doing uh, e-commerce in, in one way or another, you would have heard of her. Or, or rather, you would have heard of what Combined Cell is. All right, so uh, Amanda? Are you ready? Yeah, hi. Sorry, I think we can't hear you properly. No. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Is it okay? Yes, it's better. Uh, hang on, uh, you guys are quite soft to me. I can't really hear. We can hear you loud and clear, Amanda. <laughs> okay, okay. I think now Wei Liang is too soft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no worry, no worry. So, hi everyone. Thank you so much for, you know, joining us, even though right now it's dinner time. Um, I think it's amazing uh, sharing for Venice. I Sorry, I just came in like a couple of, uh, couple of while ago because I was uh, hooked up with a uh, meeting, just ended. So uh, hi everyone to everybody's one, two, three participants here. So I'm Amanda. Um, I'm the co-founder of um, Combined Cell. 
So I'm in charge of the marketing side of things. So um, what is Combined Sell? So Combined Sell is actually an aggregator for all the different marketplaces. We aggregate um, marketplaces like Q10, Lazada, Easybuy, Shopee, all together into a single platform to aid businesses to um, manage their business or e-commerce uh, in a very uh, seamless way. Yeah, so that's what we do. So um, I'm not too sure if you guys saw the news. Um, back in 2019, in October, we just got acquired by one of the largest uh, website builder um, in Southeast Asia called Chomatic. So, um, Right now, we are lasting with them, like we are um, working towards uh, the same goal with Traumatic at the same time. Yeah, so we also recently partner with Enterprise Singapore, whereby we help um, SMEs to digitalize their business. Or if let's say you are a business owner that has um, zero presence in marketplaces and you wish to be on the marketplaces itself, you can just um, come to us. Uh, most importantly, if you don't know anything, it's fine. We can help you with our experts. Um, so we will set you up in all the different marketplaces. We will um, help you to manage all your marketplaces, processes, operations, marketing, um, customer support, um, designing, etc. So you just have to hop on um, our package with us. So um, for more information, you can actually head to Enterprising our website to have a look. Yeah. So probably a little about myself. Um, so I start, we started Combine Cell back in um, three years ago in 2017 when I'm still in poly uh, in my second year. Um, it's um, a very enriching journey, nevertheless. Um, but um, along the way, definitely there's a lot of hiccups. But I'm thankful um, to all the people that I've met along the way and all the mentors and investors. Yeah. So I look forward to more Q&As, uh, like questions on the floor, so I can better understand like um, what are the needs that you guys are that you guys need so I can um, answer it. Yeah. <laughs> William, do you have any questions you want to ask me? <laughs> I know it's kind of short. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the sharing. Yeah. So uh, again, if uh, anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, just uh, type it in the chat. We will try to address it. And even during the panel, which will be happening shortly, we will try to address it. All right. Don't feel free to ask your questions. It's not always you can actually uh, get to talk to these uh, founders and young founders, all of them are, yeah, right. So uh, next up, uh, I will be handing over the time to Kenneth. Kenneth is our Venture Builder Lead in SUSS. So if you have heard of the Venture Builder Program, uh, that we launched by uh, ESG, right? So he's leading it for SUSS. So I'll be handing over the time to him. Uh, he will be uh, moderating for our panel. He's a serial entrepreneur himself, right? So he has lots of experience in the field. Right, and I think uh, just now during Amanda's time, you guys have heard his sexy voice. So, yeah, can I forward to you? <laughs> That's a fantastic handover, my friend. So now let me take my octave down two tones so I sound a little bit more sexy. Okay, no. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, and I think let's give a hand to the three uh, panelists who have done a great sharing. Although I think Amanda's one was a bit short, so we need to probe her a bit further mm -hmm. for this panel discussion, okay? So I will direct my first question at Amanda. Okay, the questions are for everyone, obviously. Um, pardon me if I seem a bit comfortable because some most of these faces are a bit familiar. Bernice, it's the first time we are meeting. Hi. Um, so I think right now we we are in the midst of a crazy, crazy pandemic. Um, things have probably shifted. Uh, I know fairly well that for Amanda and in the e-commerce space, it's been doing fantastically well for her. Uh, but I want to hear a little bit more about how the journey has been um, for you and your startups huh? mm -hmm. um, throughout this pandemic period. You know, maybe you can share with me from the start of the year, uh, you know, when, when we first found out about COVID was in late 2019 in December. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how that slowly shifted, um, not only the progress of your startup, but also potentially um, if you already have had traction, say like, for example, with Amanda, then how that shifted your customers' perspectives and how you had to adapt to these very quick changes that have taken place uh, in such a short time. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'll direct the question first to Amanda since she <laughs> has more information and sharing. So Amanda, over to you. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Yeah, so fun fact, I know Kenneth since, uh, we knew, I knew you since like Alibaba time. So yeah, the same batch. Have fun, have fun. So the, um, answering to your question, I think um, COVID hit us really unexpectedly just this year. We don't really know. So 
um, to be very honest, yes, I think e-commerce site has been um, moving quite quickly because as you know, because during the lockdown measures and everything, all the retail stores or brick and mortar stores are all closed. So um, the retail owners or businesses has been hit very, very badly during that time, especially for probably, probably February to April during that period. So um, just um, so we kind of say it's also luck, just that we are also helping the SMEs. We are also riding onto the digitalization wave with the government. So we are one of the appointed um, partners from Enterprise Singapore to um, help SMEs to digitalize their business. So um, how do S uh, Enterprise Singapore ca um, come in in this case is that they subsidize 90% of the service fee to all the uh, business owners. Um, a piece of good news actually ended today, um, but Enterprise Singapore in line with all the different marketplaces, they're extending this grant until the 30th of December. So if let's say there's any business owners here that want to hop onto the digitalization, the, the digital, sorry, the digitalization path, but you don't know how to, um, you can head over to Combine Cell because we have our team to help you. And it's subsidized 90% by the government. So um, it's very, very enriching because we can see the difference between the brick and mortar people that don't know anything about digitalization right now, having or getting forced to um, go on to um, e-commerce marketplaces. So for that part, I think they are pretty, um, it's pretty tough for them. It's um, not easy. They have to learn um, from scratch and it's definitely a huge change. So as for people that is currently in the wave already, they are trying to make sure that they still are uh, so sustainable in the business because a lot more brick and mortar brands are coming in and they are legit brands. So all this, um, I would say business owners that are probably, you know, power importing all their goods from Taobao and everything. It's kind of like a little danger for the people there. Yeah, because all the brands are coming in. So um, from my end, I, um, yes, I think business is um, like rising, but uh, fingers crossed, hopefully it will be better. All right, cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, on the point of brick and mortar and moving online, I think uh, in the space of this pandemic, we are all the more restricted to uh, dating online, right? So, Vanessa, now when you're asking your question and who uses uh, dating apps, who's single, yeah, so I raised my hand twice. Um, you know, moving back, rotating back into that question, uh, I think right now your, your app is still in the beta phase, is it? You guys are testing it out with some uh, early customers. Um, but yeah, how, how has that um, affected kind of maybe the, the, the perception of dating since people have no choice but to meet people for the first time online first? Uh, you know, has that kind of um, caused more attention towards dating apps such as yourself and have the, has the demands changed since uh, shifting into this COVID uh, situation that we're in now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I hope you didn't hear my dog barking. Uh, <laughs> Please bring him into the frame or her. Yeah, <laughs> you'll get a lot more, uh, you get a lot more attention. <laughs> oh, very, very 10 minutes, maybe 5 minutes. Um, yeah. Yeah, so absolutely, the, the dating industry has definitely been affected uh, by the pandemic. Um, I actually have a friend who went on 120 first dates, one to zero. 120 first dates in 2018 and 2019. Within two years, he packed his schedule. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But of course, that's not advisable for anyone now, or in fact, ever, like even when without a pandemic, right? The dating industry has definitely shifted from provi just providing matches uh, in the past to more of providing virtual dates during lockdown periods, especially. Uh, so during lockdown periods, it was quite common that uh, singles using dating apps, they, they opted for you know, video chats, virtual dating, maybe have dinner with each other over a computer screen or even watch Netflix together without the chill portion of a video call. Um, no, but on a more serious note, uh, you know, with unfortunately over 1 million deaths uh, due to the pandemic and COVID-19 is unlikely to go away anytime soon, uh, virtual dating is definitely will become the new normal for now in, country with, in countries with high infection rates. Um, so it's very unfortunate, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, it's an unfortunate year in terms of economically as well as other aspects. But uh, to be honest, we only started Laban just three months ago and it 
has been really amazing. Uh, we have been progressing really, really fast in just a few months. Uh, we did the market research, design. Now we are in the midst of app development, launching our beta app in a, in a month's time. And uh, no, but things have been progressing really well because uh, there has been very good amount of government support that uh, William mentioned earlier on. Uh, so we did receive the uh, SG Founder Grant from Enterprise Singapore. And also we have benefited a lot from the SUSS uh, Entrepreneurship Program. Our, our mentor Brian has been providing us with a lot of entrepreneurship insights and guidance to really help us make good progress in a very short amount of time. Uh, so yes, I digress and rented for very long. But, um, yeah, I think that the point I'm trying to make is, um, you know, always try to seize opportunity in, in any, any situation, right? The circumstances may, may seem tough, economic conditions may seem poor, but you never know if you really try to, um, you know, do research and find out what are grants available, what are supports, and, you know, could, any time could be a good time that, you know, uh, as man, Adam mentioned earlier on, if you're truly passionate about something, Know, wait and hold on. You can just you know start your setup. Yeah. Right. Very cool. Um. Wow. One hundred. How many is it again? One hundred and twenty first dates in a year. Is it in twenty eighteen? Yes. Yes. Twenty eighteen. Okay. The next time I'm feeling jaded, uh, going for first dates, I will take that uh piece of uh not say advice, but just knowing that someone can do that, I I will uh encourage myself a little bit more. Join the event. Yeah. I'll, right. I'll, Sure. Um, I, I actually did a quick search for it on my app store, then I was a bit disappointed to find out. Oh, yeah. One month, one month. Give us one month. Okay, cool. Uh, as far as grant support goes, who knows, maybe you can get some help from the uh, Ministry of Fam uh, Social and Family Services, or rather MCCY even, right? We're trying to boost up our birth rates as well. Um, very cool. Um, yeah, I, I also want to move that same question over to Adam, right? Um, in the space of um, AI chatbots, I think as um, more businesses move online, probably very much in line with, uh, especially in the e-commerce space, um, I imagine people uh, that are running small gigs of their own, running smaller e-commerce stores uh, at their own expense uh, with their own one-man show efforts, that um, such solutions become even more uh, important as people move more towards gig jobs uh, online. So how has things been for, for, for Cloud Intern? Uh, what's the developments you've seen throughout this pandemic? Uh, what challenges also have you faced? All right, so I got a couple of questions from that. So I'll, I'll answer it one by one. First off, um, I resonate a lot with Amanda um, because like digitalization right now is so important, especially in the e-commerce space. So it's like um, when we built Cloud Intern, so Cloud Intern, like the whole premise, the whole idea behind it was that a software that could replace an intern, right? You might not need to hire two or three interns, you just get one software and then you are good, right? It helps you to elevate all these tedious tasks. And one of the tasks, one of the areas that we are trying to focus on is like e-commerce as well, because it's such a big space right now with a lot of brick and mortar stuff moving in. Everyone, their grandma, their dog, they're all going online, buying things. Um, and so it's, we are trying to catch that digitalization wave as well. Um, Second question regarding our development, we are trying to build as fast as possible so that we can actually qualify for our vendor scheme to be a pre-approved pre solution vendor for e-commerce owners and business. Oh, is that a dog? Oh yes, yeah, everyone yeah, and yeah. their dogs, right? E-commerce. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to build AI models because a lot of people like to use AI as a buzzword, right? You know, like I have a startup, boom, AI, right? I'm a startup. Um, so like humans, AI have different levels of smartness as well. It can be really dumb AI, it can be a really, oh, a, a really smart AI. So I think that the challenge for us right now is to obtain enough data sets to actually build our AI models. Um, we are actually planning to buy a lot of these models as well as we are scraping a lot of data to train uh, this model to actually make it useful. We don't want it to just be you know, AI for the sake of AI. We want to actually value add. Um, it's a challenging process. I'm a one-man team. Uh, however, because I do run a web agency, so I employ uh, my web developers to help me build my product as well. And mostly I spend the time doing um, client acquisitions, trying to understand my target market a little bit better. So I think it's not too bad. We close five clients, uh, one of them being SUSS as well. So I think that will give us 
a lot of data sets to work with as well. So I, I think I'm looking forward. It's quite fun. All right, cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, well, wow, one man agency. Are you looking for a co-founder? Maybe one of the students are keen. Uh, uh yeah, I am. I'm actually looking for a co-founder. Um, mm -hmm. so hit me up if you are interested. Right, Adam Ishan on LinkedIn. Right, and that's how you get more followers on LinkedIn, everyone. Okay. Um, yeah, I think he brought up a good point about building data sets to build uh data to build your AI models to train your models. Um, it's um for those of you that are familiar, uh, far too often there are startups that claim that they are AI without having any real backing in terms of uh, what exactly is the AI machine about. Um, have you proven any traction? Um, so. The long and short of it is that the legitimacy of what you're trying to do uh, and the validation of your AI engine or just your model, your business model in general uh, is very important. So I think uh, that's one thing we practice here um, at SUSS uh, within all the, it's, it cuts across all the entrepreneurship pro programs, right? Um, the lean launch pad approach um, and about validation. So, um, I would just like to hear from each of you also a bit more about validation and how you go about your own unique ways with your own unique products and services. How do you validate the sort of new technologies or even old technologies being put together to come up with a new solution? What are the sort of techniques that you use um, to validate something that you're bringing to market, um, which is potentially new for most of your customers? And is it something that um, your consumers, your, your business customers, they value and how do, how do they value it? How do they acknowledge that they value it? Uh, let's get Amanda to start first again. Yeah. She looks like she's ready to answer already. I know. Okay. But yeah, I can, I can start first. So um, I think validation is quite hard for all startups to be very, very frank. Because um, at the initial phase, um, if let's say you don't have any connections to either your mentors or your investors, you really don't know which people to reach out to. And then um, how do I get the pool of people to test out? So um, I think in validation point of view, um, probably uh, I, sh I will share like how we do it in Combined Cell. Uh, we have, because we have our software uh, portion as well. So we have a group of probably about um, 10 customers that um, it's like very close to us. So they often give us feedbacks and everything. Um, so like our plannings for our technology or like which features and everything or which functions, um, it's normally generated by this group of people and probably some of uh, some different different clients as well. So we get that everything and then we kind of see, oh, what is the uh, main focus that we should probably come up with a new function. So this 10, group, uh, this 10 people, like these 10 clients that we have are very close to us. So they will be the first to test out all new functions um, of Combined Cell before we actually launch it out to the market. So um, any issues, probably first layer will be Combined Cell, then them. So once um, it get past their end with um, no issues already, we will then roll it out to the entire public. Yeah, so um, this is how um, our, we do our validation from the very, very start. But um, probably uh, in our initial phase when we are still a startup, uh, how we actually do our validation is that we crawl out all the different marketplaces, uh, uh, marketplaces uh, data for the sellers. We cold call one by one uh, to them to probably pitch them our ideas. Uh, I know it's very, very time consuming here, but only through that you're able to know like whether your idea work. So I, yeah, so we went door to door, door knock, cold calls and everything. Yeah, so that is the initial phase. And then now the validation phase for the software is like this. All right, very cool. Yeah, group of 10 customers uh, that you always go back to, right, you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, so I think they must be on your speed dial and every time you're giving them a call, they know like, oh my God, it's going to be an hour long call again with Amanda. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. But then the other, I would say customers are very important. They are the one that make us move forward and mm -hmm. probably improve from our service. So right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Um, in any given startup, in whatever business segment you may be in, um, the relationships with your customers uh, are very important, mm -hmm. uh, especially with your early adopters, because those are the people that will then go and spread um, the beauty and uh, coolness, right, of the of the solution that you're creating. Yeah. So, talking about relationships, yeah, what about uh, for? Uh, Venice, yourself and your startup. How how is that um, this whole validation process taking place? I think it, it's cool that you are just uh, sort of what you mentioned three months in, right? Uh, with the with the solution or with the idea. So it's great to hear from your angle um, 
at this very initial stage, how is that validation process like? Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Um, so I, as mentioned previously, um, my sharing earlier on, uh, actually every single element of Leven has, has been developed as per user's needs. And really before even coming on the design or planning a product really, we actually uh, tested the market. Uh, so we seek validation, product validation, market validation by um, like Amanda pointed out, uh, it's a very, very time consuming way to really like hustle and try to get solicit feedback from your potential customers and all that. But that's just how it is at the start. Uh, like Adam and I were chatting earlier on before we started this pet, uh, sharing that uh, I actually messaged him, I think more than three months ago. So actually earlier this year, I pretty much like message, you know, uh, friends, friends of friends, or complete strangers via LinkedIn, uh, on other avenues as well. It's really just to reach out to as many singles as possible in Singapore to kind of really test the market and find out what the exact pain points. Because when I'm sure that everyone is, you know, in this panel today or, or joining, you know, as uh, you guys are students, you surely you guys are maybe want to be an entrepreneur one day or, you know, you're curious about it. But um, there's really no better way to really uh, start a startup than actually solving a problem. You don't just want to build a product for the sake of building it, right? You first find out like, what's actually a problem that people are facing, uh, which we did. Like, a lot of consumers kept using, a lot of our users survey kept saying that um, they, are, they are very tired of poor quality and uh, existing dating apps wasting their time which is why our tagline is actually to not waste time because it's actually, this phrase is at the back of mind of so many singles in Singapore. Uh, so we are building a solution after uh, really seeking like validation in that sense uh, to provide a platform to singles in need. Yeah. Yes. All right, very cool. Thanks for sharing your points about, um, yeah, I think doing your homework is very important, huh? even when it comes to doing your TMAs, GBAs, and ECAs, right? To all the students here, that's a familiar acronym. Uh, for Adam, you weren't, uh, uh, or for Adam and Bernice, you were not SUSS students. So it is just different fancy Singaporean acronyms for the different assignments that they have to submit, right? Um, yeah, still on the topic of uh, validation, um, also, can I hear a bit more from Adam about what's the kind of groundwork that you really had to do? Um, because as you mentioned, you know, some of the AIs that you're looking to, to bring into the, the entire solution, these are not things that you um, have necessarily created on your own. Maybe you will license certain AIs also. But I think in order to first do that, you need to have a very deep understanding uh, of what exactly uh, the AI entails. Um, and then going on from there, validating that AI also, because taking it in is just the first step, right? As you mentioned, you need to collect data and whatnot. So can you just share a bit more about your validation process uh, and the homework that you kind of needed to do? Okay, uh, I'll share a bit more from the tech one, but before that, so like mm. Bernice actually reached out to me on <laughs> June and she sent me this very captivating LinkedIn message. Right. Thank you for connecting with me. I'm Bernice and I'm working together with a team of specialists on building a user-driven dating solution for highly eligible singles looking for a serious relationship. I looked at this message, I was like, oh, that's it. This message tops the list of all of the LinkedIn marketing spams that you get daily. <laughs> I was like, wow, what up? Back then, I wasn't looking for anything. So uh, I told Bernice that I didn't sign up for it, but I thought that was amazing, right? And uh, it shows that as a founder, especially like an early stage founder, there's a lot of groundwork, there's a lot of hustling and, you know, a lot of effort needed to actually get your product out. So being a tech product, um, I, I consider myself a tech founder and I actually fall into a category of fallacy, meaning that a lot of the time tech founders are very gung-ho about their tech, right? We are, we are tech people, right? We don't necessarily essentially understand a lot of the business aspect initially. So we just build the tech, right? We want it to be more techy, the techy, the better, but that's not necessarily the case. So I mentioned that I started a, a startup around two years ago and it failed because my team was so focused on the tech that we failed to engage with our target market to really understand what our user group actually wanted. So I told myself, I'm not going to make the same mistake again. I was, I'm fortunate enough to have uh, clients from my web development agency that I can directly tap to. And these are the exact customer 
profile that I'm looking for, right? SME owners looking to save costs with resources and manpower and automate their business processes. So for me, it was as simple as just calling out my client and like calling them one by one. Hey, you know, we are launching a new, uh, we are doing a spin-off of the startup. Uh, we are launching a new service. Um, can you give us, um, and then we start to pitch to them and we start to understand what, they, what are their actual pain points. So I think like from what I'm trying to say is you cannot just assume the pain point just because maybe you're facing it yourself or that you feel that, okay, this is lacking the market. You actually got to go in balls deep or in, in that case, you know, fingers deep and try and really understand what drives all this pain point from the target audience and then create a solution to solve it. So instead of, you know, build your product first and then trying to force a market fit down to your target audience, instead talk to your target audience first and then produce a product that's fitted together with, that's suitable for them. And on the tech standpoint, um, being a tech founder is also a little bit difficult, right? Because um, in order to build good software, you actually need to have a, lot, a good team that understands software, how to code well, how to understand the processes, as well as you need to understand um, how your technology, how you're going to the best technology to apply for different processes. So I think in, in order to build a successful AI, you have to really train it a lot. So a lot of people don't know how AI works. So uh, maybe I just do a quick crash course, two liner, super simplistic. So how it works is that you have a engine that allows you to, that takes in data, study data, and try to find patterns that normally people can't really see, right? So once you generate enough pattern enough, it's smart or like intelligent enough to predict future patterns. And that's why AI is very useful because it allows people to actually, you know, predict uh, matches, predict compatibility in the terms of like dating, right? You know, you have dating percentages. You can use AI to actually see how, like how fast your company is growing, what kind of solutions you need, um, you know, in terms of e-commerce, there's so many applications for AI. And it's really interesting, but it's very difficult to implement and it's very expensive. So we are actually spending the bulk of our development costs, not developing, but actually buying data. And I think um, if you are planning to start an AI startup, right? Um, I think it's first very important to understand how AI works. Number two, get someone in your development team to understand how AI works as well, because it's not something that you can download and plug into your code. It requires months and months of training and a lot of data feeding. Uh, but it's, it's a fun process. If you're, if you're planning to do an AI startup, Go for it. It's hella fun. Um, yeah. So that's it from, from my end. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. So um, I'm going to shift to a slightly more um, general but personal question to, to, to our panelists here. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, the audience makeup is largely people that are the students, right, that are going for their work attachments. Um, so it could be very likely they need to fulfill this uh, six-month work attachment that they have to do as part of their graduation requirements. Um, I'm not here to get people to, to give up their corporate jobs or anything, but I also want to hear from, from each of you, um, maybe a bit more from Bernice and also partially from Amanda, that uh, I think you have a little bit of corporate background also. Um, I myself was going down the corporate path um, in the finance space, uh, but something along the way kind of made me also want to consider uh, entrepreneurship a, a, as a potential career path, right? Um, for me, it was really realizing the fact that I always had this constant hunger to solve problems, um, usually problems that are not my own. So people usually like to tell me to butt out of, my, of, my, of the things that is not really bothering me but I just feel that I can't sit with myself, right? I can't be with myself and, and just uh, know that something is causing someone some discomfort, some problems, some issues, um, yet at the same time, knowing that I have the capacity to try and look and potentially address the problem, even though I may not be the smartest person in the room to do so. Um, so before I elaborate too much about my personal life story, because you are the panelist and I'm the moderator, I want to hear also from each of you, um, what kind of got you started in the startup realm? Um, I know for Adam, his route is, has been always, you know, pretty clear cut. He's got that entrepreneurship route. But I think also we want to hear that story um, of that constant pursuit since young. I think for me, to be very frank, I didn't start off thinking that I would be wanting to create my own startup and my own business. But I realized that innately something in me wanted to be an entrepreneur, just that it took time to come out, uh, to come to light. So uh, I will not force Amanda to answer the question first this time. 
uh, I'll leave it to any of you three to, to, to speak up first. And Vernice unmuted herself already, so I think she will start first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, happy, happy. Thanks, Kenna, for the question. Um, wow, yeah, so it's interesting that Kenna mentioned that uh, Adam has always been you know, very uh, focused on you know, becoming an entrepreneur. And I think it's amazing that you always set sight on, on you know, pursuing your dream as an entrepreneur. Uh, to be frank, I didn't. So I was one of those boring business school students uh, in university. I told myself that, okay, every summer, every winter break, I'm going to do an internship at a bank. And what's the point of getting a, an internship at a bank? Oh, to get a better internship at a, at a better bank next time. So by the time I graduated, I actually did four internships in finance. Uh, and in a sense, I kind of got my dream job at the end of graduation because uh, I ended up working on the trading floor um, at Credit Suisse in Hong Kong when I graduated. And uh, I was, so I worked there for like one, two years. And I, I found that um, while working at a corporate, at an MNC, it's great, you know, you learn to be uh, very structured, organized, that's maybe more kind of, um, structure way of guide, guidance as well. You kind of be learn to be uh, gain experience in the niche field that you're working in in the MNC. However, I felt that when I was sitting on my desk, I felt that whatever I was doing, there were 20 other banks doing the exact same thing for my clients. It was just up to my client as to, uh, oh, uh, which trader I want to work with today. Yeah. Uh, then uh, kind of by chance, because of personal matters, I, I want to move back to Singapore. And my sister, Belle, uh, so she started Policy Pal a few years ago. It got acquired by EMTD this year. Uh, she asked me to join her team. So I ended up joining a startup from investment bank. I went to startup and I realized that um, it was amazing. I really, really loved it because in a startup, you, get, you, are, you have so much more impact uh, with the work that you do on a daily basis. For example, when I, uh, like I took a break from my work for half an hour, one hour, I actually cut, kind of cost a score in, in progress, in the startup progress even. Like that's how much impact I felt. And I was able to really learn. Um, it's a common phrase, right? At startup, you kind of have to wear many hats. Uh, so I could learn many things at the same time. And I just felt really, really uh, passionate about the amount of impact I, I could have at the startup. And uh, from there, I really enjoyed my work there, but uh, I also felt that I, I really want to build something from scratch myself as well. And so, yeah, here, here I am. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I took a quick look at her, her LinkedIn before the, the, the whole session started, and she's not kidding. She's had a lot of internships in finance uh, positions. But yeah, great to hear uh, this what, what kind of unlocked you and, and moved you into the startup space also. Thanks for sharing, Bernice, because some of these stories can be a bit more personal. So uh, let's also appreciate all of them for sharing. I think Adam just unmuted himself. But before you share, uh, we'll be moving on to the Q&A after this. If any of you have questions, feel free to type it up in the chat now, and then we can start uh, with the questions immediately after. Adam, go ahead. Um, okay, so I, I think I'm pretty young. I like to believe that I'm young. Uh, I'm 22 this year. I said 22 two days ago. Happy birthday to me, right? Um, so I started off entrepreneurship um, as um, for a necess necessity, right? My, um, a couple years ago, um, I wasn't in a really good position, really needed to start working. I never actually imagined myself to be an entrepreneur. I, I thought I was always going to be a scientist. I took biomedical science in Yang Poly. Right. I turned down a, a Silicon Valley internship to work in the NUS medical labs to do cancer research. I'm very passionate about um, being a scientist. However, I was forced to try and um, earn some income for the family. And that's why I started uh, my entrepreneurship journey. Over time, I started liking it and I took the opportunity for it to explore my key different interests. A lot of people do not know that I actually want to work a corporate job in the future. And doing startups and entrepreneurship is a mean for me to explore my interests because, um, and to actually, un I mean, it's, I think one of the best employees that you can get is someone who was once an employer. Um, because like, I actually am very interested in doing consulting. And that's why like, whatever I'm doing is kind of steering in line with my goal to do consulting. 
for example, doing a web consultancy from two years ago, and even now helping SMEs and startups improve business processes. It's very in line with what I want to achieve in the future to work in a consulting firm. So I'm like doing it the opposite way around, um, which is something that I think is cool. It's not a lot of people aren't really doing it. And I think that, you know, if you actually do want to do a corporate job in the future, you can do a startup. You can learn a lot from it, get a lot of real life experience that could really be good for your resume when you actually apply for these big firms. Yeah, that's it. Nice. I like to see this uh, common team of um, being in an uncomfortable situation and then deciding somehow to pursue a potentially start a startup uh, route as a as a career choice. I think for for many of us, um, yes, it is a it is an informed decision that we pursue um, when we do, do decide to go into a startup. But um, sometimes it's also out of circumstance. Um, but what matters most is that we make the most out of it. Right, Amanda. So, how how did you make the most out of your situation? <laughs> um, okay, so for me, I think I'm similar to Kenneth. I don't. I really like to butt into a lot of people's issues. <laughs> I like to be, you know, people say kipo, like to oh to find out like how can we help people to solve issues. So to be very frank, I'm not really a, like entrepreneur from the very very start. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, usuals, going down the same path. Once I graduate, I should work in an MNC, I get high pay, and then just be a normal employee. Um, so I think what sparks me will be um, probably the founders that I meet, I, I, I meet throughout uh, my entire combined cell journey. So um, a little fun fact, I actually met my founder in Poly. So he's my Poly friend, and uh, together with his friend in, back in Malaysia, in KL, uh, his uh, so in KL is our CTO sitting in KL, and then um my found uh, the founder that we have right now is in Singapore. So I think it all sparks uh, when me and him it's like in a competition together. So it's really very very competitive to be a, to to start off with, and he's always a top student in, in school. Yeah, and he really liked to butt in with a lot of um people stuff like me also. So that's when we, you know, um kind of participate in the same competition together, and I know him. So from there, he said, hey, why not, um, since you are as competitive as me, <laughs> why not, uh, let's start up, combine, let's set up um, an idea and then we see how it goes. So um, we all started off uh, back in RP. Uh, so uh, RP has a business incubation center. That is when uh, all our ideas start to bloom and then we kind of make amendments and then today we have combined some. So I think it's very, a very interesting journey because from a start, to, I don't really have an idea that I will walk through the journey right now that I'm in. So I thought that I would graduate and yeah. But it's nevertheless interesting, although I, you know, I face a lot of obstacles sometimes. We break down uh, as humans also. So we are not 100%, you know, perfect, even though we are entrepreneurs. <laughs> but uh, we do break down and I think um, breaking down sometimes is okay. Uh, we just have to always stand up whenever we face any challenges. Yeah, so that is um, my very typical journey. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, I hope um, you are starting, I mean, the audience is starting to churn in questions right now, okay? If not, we're just going to, four people be staring at each other very awkwardly in, in just a second. Um, yeah, I think what, what's great that they shared is um, that there's this real hunger, right, to, to, to be solving problems around them, uh, either their own problems or the problems of others. Uh, actually, more importantly, uh, the problems of others uh, that's around them, even as a consultant, uh, as Adam so wishes to pursue, you are looking at people's challenges that they're facing and then trying to come up with the best solutions uh, that you can for them. Um, but the most important thing is that it is other people's challenges. And the, cha the biggest challenge to you is understanding and acknowledging that you are not that person and that process of understanding the perception of your customers takes time, takes effort. Um, but if you put in the effort, um, you know, and you're okay to fail, there's potentially a, a rainbow at the end of the tunnel, right? That you can you can be looking out for. And I think what's great about the panelists that we have on today is that, you know, they make it seem, they make entrepreneurship seem a little less scary. You know, they are not crazy Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg of the world, or Adam might be. Um, but, you know, for, for the rest of us, for the commoners, um, it's okay. It's, uh, it's one thing is that's important is that we are all okay. Uh, we, and we learn to accept the failures and the mistakes that we make along the way. And what matters is how we deal with uh, the cards that we are dealt with, right? Um, so I think for, for, the, for the audience here with us today, 
um, even if you're not choosing, uh, will not eventually choose entrepreneurship as a path uh, for your personal career. I think what's more important is the sharing that we've heard uh, from the three of them today, um, the distinguished guests, right? Is the, the mentality, the thought processes, the attitude, the creativity, the grit that has pushed them through. Um, you know, these are things that are not unique just to entrepreneurs. They are also unique. Uh, and they're also valuable to people within workplaces as well. And I hope these are things that you've picked up uh, along the way during this uh, hour, about an hour or so um, webinar that we have, and that all this will add value to your own work attachments uh, in the future. And if you so choose to pursue entrepreneurship, you know that you have a great um, team of people that you can uh, connect with uh, via SUSS and also through these uh, startups that have been with us um, in their journey as well. Um, yeah, and I think one great characteristic that I always like to describe, Weilang probably has heard this a couple of times before already, is that um, one unique thing about what we do and how we do it is that uh, I take a quote from Mike Rowe. So if you do not know who Mike Rowe is because you belong to a different generation from me, uh, Mike Rowe is the, the host of Dirty Jobs uh, that was previously one of the top shows on Discovery Channel. So Dirty Jobs is a show about uh, people that work really... Um, jobs that you do not really think like as a maybe an educated person in a university you are not going to think of pursuing jobs like that like for example sewage cleaner um, pig farmer and things like that um, but some of them are really successful entrepreneurs with great stories of their own and after filming something like 300 over episodes what he he learned out of it one of the key things that that he kind of reflected upon was that what made these people great was that they looked at where everyone else was going and they went the other way and with that, uh, I think I will just want to thank the panelists again for your sharing and I will hand the, back, the time back to Wei Liang. Thanks so much, everyone. Right. So uh, I will just do a last call for questions. Are you, sure? Are you guys sure you guys have no questions? Oh, I think I saw missed the questions earlier. Okay, so we can cover some questions. Yeah? Oh, there are questions? I don't see. Yeah, I saw slide. two questions on the... Uh, oh, they messaged me privately. So intimate. <laughs> This is not Lavenna. Huh? You don't have to, you know, slide into my DM, okay? Um, okay, let's go to questions before I, I hand the time over to Ilang then. First question is, how do you overcome the fear of going into something so unknown, especially as the sole founder? So maybe a bit more for Adam, but I think it's relevant for everyone. Lah. Even if you are not a single founder, you are also feeling very lost at times, yeah? So anyone can take this uh, question. I th um, okay, this maybe I'll... Ray, by the way. Sorry, Ray Xuan. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Ray. Um, so, I think for me, um, I, I think it was a very scary process. Um, when I started off my entrepreneurship journey, it's really make it or you're not going to survive kind of thing. So, there was a fire underneath me that I was like, okay, I really need to try as much as possible. I was pressurized to uh, exhaust all options possible. It's a very stressful way to start off and might not be the most optimal way but I was literally kicked out of my comfort zone, thrown into the fires of hell and asked to survive. Um, and I tried, I really tried a lot of um, ways to make money online when I was younger, you know, from drop shipping to Amazon FBA. Um, I, I, and like Q10, right, where I was once, I was a level, I was a power seller there. Um, it was uncomfortable, but I think eventually in order to survive, like you learn the skill sets that you need, uh, and then you eventually just go deep in and brief and hope that you make it. At least that was for me. Eventually, I think I came out quite okay. Uh, however, if like you're a student right now and you're thinking, you know, I have a startup idea, but I don't know whether I got time to pursue it, nor like, you know, uh, is it going to affect my grades? Or, uh, you know, what if I fail? I think something that's important is that um, scale your, your idea down to, some, to something that's scary, right? You know, you have a huge business idea you, you want to change the world start small really small something that you know it's, it's something that you can manage build it scale it up from there and i think as you scale up slowly you will be more used to it and it will be less scary yeah and you can go to suss for all of the resources the entrepreneurship team has provided kick ass resources right from mentors to resources to opportunities and grants so you you guys are in like a fantastic place um and that's why i also became a suss cet student so technically, I'm an SUSS student as well. That's some great organic marketing, man. Thanks, Adam. 
right? So, you know, we're here for you. Uh, but yeah, some great points that he shared um, about how uh, not the most pleasant way to start in it, but sometimes it's also because when you are so out of resources that uh, the best and brightest comes out of you, right? Um, the Vanessa or Amanda, do you have anything else to add? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I just read that Mark also sends a similar question in the group chat, general group chat, not sliding DM to channel. Uh, yeah. uh, so how do you guys keep yourself motivated during setbacks, all right, when future is uncertain? So I think the question is very similar. Um, so I, Levent joined uh, the SUSS Entrepreneurship Program, right, two months ago. Uh, and so we got a mentor from this SUSS program. Uh, it's called Brian, uh, who is the Entrepreneur in Residence. Uh, it's a very, very helpful mentor so far. Probably chatted with him like four, five sessions so far. And the first, um, yeah, the first, I remember very well that the first time uh, that we chatted with Brian, our mentor, uh, he actually took like a solid 10, 15 minutes to keep asking us like, okay, why, you, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Like why? The reason why he kept doing that is sometimes people don't really um, find the underlying passion or reasons why they want to actually start start up. And they after they get face a few rejections, then maybe they, they kind of quit after a few months. Oh, sorry, yeah, my dog. Um, yeah, he's a puppy, so he's very very hard to control now. Um, yeah, so I think it's really really important for you to kind of take a step back and really really ask yourself like why do you want to do this if you want to build a startup because you want to be a millionaire in a year's time you probably shouldn't do it right you, you have to have really meaningful underlying reasons to kind of drive drive you and let you be remain passionate you know no matter how many rejections you have you face i mean we only started three months ago but i probably re face more rejections in the last three months than in the rest of my life. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's um, you know, I, I still know why, you know, I, I want to do this and I'm very passionate about building a solution that could help many people. Which brings me, I forgot to highlight our registration URL earlier on. <laughs> you guys should go to, let me tell you the group chat, okay, leven.co slash register. Um, yeah, just, I mean, it's a free app. There's really no harm trying it out. And if you guys have any specific questions, just uh, you know, uh, ask me here or even you know, hit me up on LinkedIn as well. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right. Very cool. Um, Amanda, any thoughts to share also? Well, I think both Bernice and Adam share very, very good points. I, yeah. So um, failures, obstacles, rejections. I cannot um agree more than what Bernice said. I think we really face so much rejection in, um, to, a, to the extent that we just got numb. Just, okay, if it's rejection, okay, then it's time to stand up again. So I think it's, it's bound to uh, making a lot of rejections, meeting a lot of walls that uh, probably need to, you know, just let us be awake and then, hey, probably that's not what we should be moving forward to. And then there are some tricks that we need to do. So uh, fear, I think um, once you actually hop onto the stage whereby um, you don't fear whether you have any customers anymore. You fear whether whatever you walk down the road, is it right? Because when you have more clients or you have the demand, you tend to think about uh, to yourself, hey, am I doing it right? Am I doing it correctly? So a lot of questions, a lot of self doubts come in. So the fear is no longer whether my idea will work or it's whether is my company sustainable to sustain my employees. So I think um, apart from having the fear at the front, I think at the back is a lot of um, self-doubting, yeah, which I face a lot um, during my journey in combine self. Yeah. And, and if I can ask relating to sort of the, the one of the questions that was brought up by a person that has requested to stay anonymous, um, <laughs> sort of uh, taking or rather, what, what, what did you do, you know, or, or what helped you have that confidence in, in pursuing what you wanted to do, right? Um, I think it's not full confidence because there's definitely an element of fear in there. Even going ahead, you know that probably there's a good amount of fear there. Um, but yeah, what, what made you decide to, to kind of pursue that path? 
Um, and maybe the question pertaining about money, lah. I think because of uh, with regards to potentially giving up a stable income, right? Yeah. I think um, like what Bernice had mentioned just now, I think it's the passion. So um, I met Brian before as well. So yeah, I've been through Brian's strict questions asking you why you want to do so, even if you fail, what are you going to do next or what is your next step? So I think all these questions are solid questions that um, normally um, non-good mentors will uh, ask you, but Brian is really a good mentor to me and I met him before. So he asked a lot of strategic questions because he want to know that you don't, um, do your startup because everybody thought, um, ah, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. I can just go to Bali, shake my leg at a beach, and then, you know, I can work from the beach. So if, um, so I'm so sorry to everybody that have this mindset. So if you have this mindset, then um, probably you are not cut out of the entrepreneur world because um, it's not as simple as sitting at a beach, having a beach holiday and just doing your work. Yeah, it, it's never this case. So I think Brian's questions really dawn on to us. Like if let's say we really meet a lot of um, troubles, obstacles along the way, are we still going to face it? Are we still going to be at the forefront saying that, hey, it's okay. No matter what issues I have or no matter what challenges I have, I will still uh, stand very firm in the ground that, hey, I'm still doing what I love doing because I believe this will work. Yeah, so um, that is the mindset I have. Um, same, I pro probably same as Bernice is that I truly believe um, the message or the mission that combined cells want to bring to everybody um, in the entire world. Yeah. Great. So probably it's passion for me. Yeah, and helping people. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that uh, little short motivation speech, Amanda. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that kind of wraps up most of the questions. There's one last question about having a business idea that you think is feasible but not having capital or tech background okay capital background what do you mean do you mean not having capital to start the idea right and then all tech background so i think it's two questions um would any of you want to share about starting an idea without capital i think we are all uh, equipped to answer that question right <laughs> yeah anyone want to share on that if not i will just say that um, essentially if you don't have capital uh, but you want to start uh, working on an idea you should uh, ideally first and foremost think about how to make it as lean as possible. So, um, you know, learning about the lean launchpad uh, methodology, um, working on the idea and validating without having actu an actual product or service is something that's very doable. So without having to build a final uh, final product, you know, usually people think that's the usual, that the, the typical route someone needs to end up having a, a physical or maybe a fully built online product before you can find out whether there's a customer base. But I think for most of us here, we, we, you know, we believe right, in this uh, Lean Launchpad methodology in building things that are much more simplified uh, version of what your final product may be and then just going out to find out whether first and foremost, the important thing is that whether you have customers that are willing to pay for this mock-up, say for example, of your product or service. Once you have some of that traction, you can start looking towards, um, you know, there's things like the Startup SG Founder Grant that has recently been enhanced. So this comes from Enterprise Singapore. Um, you can get basically a $50,000 grant, of course, with certain conditions attached. Um, if that route is not available to you, um, you can always continue doing further validation, getting people to start paying maybe even for some of your services and then look for very initial investors. Could be your friends and family investors. It could be even as early as uh, if you are ready, even at some point, uh, pre-seed investment from those more, um, shall I say, risky uh, investors like angel investors and whatnot that are willing to put down maybe a few tens of thousands. That's enough for you to get your idea started. Adam, you want to add a point, is it? Uh, yeah, I, I would like to add on a little bit. I think kind of covered from like five to a hundred. I'm going to just touch a little bit on zero to five. Yeah. So, uh, I became like this question came out a lot. I was I'm giving a talk in um Nian as well as SP on like student entrepreneurship, like people who really do not have any capital, very limited skill sets, um, to try and build an idea. So in order to get to zero to five, let's go with the tech first. Um, you actually can go online and search out for zero code tools. So there are, it's technology and coding has become so advanced that we build that coders actually build tools so that people who do not know how to code can actually like applicate web applications and mobile applications as well. Something that is really popular and something that a personal friend of mine recently did a successful startup on is a 
um, website called Bubble. So basically, it's like a no visual programming um, language. Basically, people who do not know how to code, they can build a web application using Bubble. So I would recommend you to check it out. And the thing about this kind of solutions is they are significantly cheaper. They cost maybe like $50 to $100 a month instead of spending like upfront three to $8,000 to build your MVP. So in terms of how do you get $100 a month uh, to start up your cap, to start up your business idea, well, I would say uh, a part-time job would be a good place to start, right? Because like, I you know, mean, like you work 10 hours for $8 per hour, you get 80 bucks. That's enough to last your tech solution for a month. So um, a lot of people say that they don't have any capital, absolutely zero. I say stop your mobile legend, put down your Netflix, go and get a quick part-time job. You have $200, that's enough to start off your business idea. Get a no-code solution, build out your prototype, and then you can continue from five to 100, like what Kenneth has just previously mentioned. Yeah. Very cool. Um, you Could you also maybe share, um, Actually, maybe more for Amanda and Venice because you have a bit more of a tech background, right? For people without a tech background, where do they get started? Um, mm. as, so, okay, wait, let me pull... Uh, was that question directed to me? Um, I, I was a general question, but I think it's open to the floor to answer, yeah. Okay, I'll pass um, the time to Venice and Amanda. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because I think maybe some of them are not coming from tech backgrounds per se, yeah. So probably, yeah, so I'll take the question. So mm. I am a non-tech person. So even though I'm running a tech company, but yeah, I have zero tech, you know, um, knowledge about it. So I think um, if let's say we don't really have a tech knowledge about it, I think a tech co-founder joining the group is important because um, uh, apart from what Adam shared, I, um, you know, bubble.com, I just did a rough search also at the same time. Well, yeah, I think it's quite cool. So, um, so for me, I don't really have any um, background about tech. But I think at some point of time, you still have to know a little bit about what you guys do and how is the linkage, even though um, you have zero knowledge. So deep tech and everything probably can leave it to your co-founders. I think they will settle all the codings and everything, but the logic behind or the entire system, I think it's still somewhat substantial for um, you to know. Yeah, so I took a really long time to understand also because um, for me, it's like, oh, I'm just there. I don't really know tech and then it's quite confusing to me. So um, that's my tough journey at the very front. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, okay, let's wrap it up with a last question. This is a very, very specific question, but uh, interesting nonetheless. It's Once again, it's a private question, so none of you are seeing it. Uh, the question to all the, the panelists is, if someone were to offer you double of your valuation right now, would you sell your business off? <laughs> this is from Caden. Yeah. Um, maybe I say first. <laughs> sure, sure. Because, yeah, I probably have the experience of selling the business. Mm. Um, so probably my question would be whether I regret selling my business to traumatic on, on my end mm. um, I think there is no right or wrong to this uh, because um, being a founder you want your idea to boom to be at a certain level either you want to be, to be listed etc but it's still um, down to on your end whether can you scale your business to the extent that everyone in the entire world know about your business if you can't probably your choice will be selling to a bigger player because they have the experience they have the connections to reach out to um, bigger parts of the world. So, um, so during my acquisition, this is what I'm thinking because I know that I only have a certain limitation to run and I know Combine Cell will be only there at probably X years. So if I have a bigger player to come in, probably they can run, uh, during X years, they can run more, probably head to different, different countries. So that is the reason uh, why I actually um, sell my company back then. Um, so whether I regret selling or not, I think it's still fine at the moment, but it's still like a bittersweet feeling because it's your baby after all. Yeah. So that's my thoughts. <laughs> oh. The other two founders. <laughs> um, so recently I was, I was given an offer to actually um, sell my web development firm. It's been by two years. A Vietnamese firm wants to get a local presence in Singapore. They want to pick it up. I literally told them, if you double the valuation, I'll say yes. So to, I guess a literal answer is yes. <laughs> Okay, thanks for sharing, Adam. That's a very direct uh, question. Sounds like a planted question suddenly. Uh, Bernice, yep. 
Uh, well, as you guys are aware now, uh, Levan only started three three months ago. But uh, before that, I was at Policy Cloud for a few years, and Policy Cloud was acquired, that I mentioned earlier, by AMTD, a uh, Hong Kong company, earlier this year. And I think in terms of, um, sorry, yeah, I'm not talking about Levan here because it's not really applicable here. But I think it really really depends on the the timing, and what what you think is best for the company, like I Amanda mean, says your baby, right? Because um uh so uh Clara's good friends with uh Shu Ray, uh founder of Carousel. I remember last year, year before, he always said that, oh, we are only one percent done for Carousel. You know, we're only one percent done. That's his favorite phrase that he's used. But he recently kind of sold uh or acquired an uh, enormous uh enormous stake uh to someone else, right? Carousel. So the thing is uh, yeah, I don't think he moved from 1% to like 99% in a year, right? And yeah, my point is, it's really about the timing and what you think is, is best well for the business, I guess. Yeah, at a specific moment. Right. All right, very cool. Thanks for all your answers to the fantastic questions from the audience. Yeah, I think it's quite a good uh, chunk of questions considering you took a good amount of time to respond to them also. And very um, useful and uh, great insights from each one of them. Uh, so I think that pretty much wraps up the panelist, or rather the panel discussion. And now I will officially hand the time back to Wei Liang. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, Kenneth. Uh, thank, thanks to the panelists for the sharing. I hope that uh, this actually gives you guys some uh, interest in entrepreneurship. Uh, maybe some of you are already uh, starting to want to uh, do your own entrepreneurial uh, journey, right? All right, so uh, I'll quickly run through and end off. Uh, so I've, I've ran through this earlier and uh, give me a quick shout out again. So if you are interested, you don't know where to start, you want to start something, feel free to join us in the Impact Startup Challenge. Remember the course code CTO303ACI. So in your uh, ECR, you can actually apply for this. So this will be a five credit bearing course. You can also take it as a non-credit bearing. Right, and the last thing that everyone is waiting for, yes, your questionnaire. So uh, for those who needs to complete your pre-WA uh, requirements, uh, feel free to fill in this questionnaire. So, uh, you, you, I mean, it's, it's pointless if you screenshot this and send to your friend because what we will do is we will generate the report, we will look at your sign up and see who is really here, right? So I'll be leaving this here for a while. Uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to drop an email to entrepreneurship at suss.edu.sg or you can feel free to uh, just uh, type it in the chat here. I will stay around for a while longer. And if you are done, if you have no other questions, I would like to thank all the panelists again for taking their time. Very, very insightful. Even for me, I learned how, how they actually get started and all. So, yeah, thank you, panelists, and thanks everyone for joining us. All right, thanks everyone. Yeah. Okay, I have people asking about the password for the survey. The password is on the screen, W-A-C-H-A-L. Just type that in.
uh, regarding the question on whether this is a talk or not a workshop, uh, you can select as a talk. Alright, I'll be leaving the screen on for one to two more minutes. So if you have not captured the, the link or the QR code, please do so. Complete your question. Again. Okay, and if you're done with the questionnaire, feel free to drop off the call. Thank you for attending and for your questions today. Feel free to be connected with the speakers, especially Adam. I see him sending his uh, IG as well. Right, I'll be ending off the meeting. So if you have any questions, anything you wish to clarify, just feel free to drop entrepreneurship at suss.edu.sg an email. And I will try to reply from there. All right, thank you everyone and have a good night.